Heavenly Father, today we see your son Solomon ask for wisdom. Give us that gift too, Lord. Give us the wisdom that comes from your word to know the good and the bad, to know the right and the wrong, and to listen and love you. Help us today to have the faith and the wisdom of Solomon to hold on to you and to follow your word. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'd like you to imagine, just for a moment, I want you to imagine that happy moment when you're holding a newborn. Could be your baby, could be somebody else's baby, could be your grandchild, doesn't matter. Imagine that happy moment when you have a cooing, hopefully not screaming, newborn in your arms. And your mind starts to dream. You start to think of all the things that newborn could be. What do you think when you hold a newborn in your arms? What are the dreams, the aspirations, the goals that you have when you hold a newborn, a niece, a nephew, a child, a grandchild? Share with me something. Sir, just became a drop the baby. Go, go, drop the baby. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lord, give me some strength, Lord. That's right. Yeah. Sir, be happy. Excitement? Explain. Uh, excited about a newborn in the world, excited about your newborn child, grandchild, uh, uh, excited about the life of this child. I mean, all kinds of things over here. Yeah, you're, you're thinking about the present, but man, the future. What could this be? Persevere in the faith. 
not, not, a, not enough, right? Often in Bible scriptures and the stories we've been looking at, we've seen a lot of failures of faith. We've seen a lot of parents not pass down the faith to their children. Today's a happy example when it actually happens. When a man held a baby in his arms, when David held Solomon in his arms, and all that went into holding Solomon in his arms. And yet for Solomon to have the faith of his father, to persevere in faith. When as we look, I mean, we see Adonijah and Absalom and Ammon. We've seen story after story of some pretty unfaithful children. Today we have that good story. When the one son continues in the faith of his father. And not only his father's faith, but makes it his own. In my family and yours, there are many examples when people do not continue in faith. Today I want to kind of have a plate full of this. Here's one right now. Let's take a look at our reading from 1 Kings chapter 3. We're continuing from last week as we're going through the Old Testament. David is dead, Solomon is king. We had a little fighting last week as who's going to be in charge of the throne. And now we're going to see Solomon's kind of first act as he is king. First Kings chapter 3. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughters. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Question number one. Solomon is already married at 20 or so with a one-year-old son as he becomes king. Why does Solomon take a wife from Egypt? John? Well, a lot of times it was a, a marriage of alliance and convenience where you set up some sort of, to make the alliance strong, you marry, you send your children on to marry the other. An alliance between nations? What's ironic about Egyptians marrying into Hebrews? These are the slaves that got away from us, right? I'm married with them, right? So there, there is something to that. There is some sort of military alliance. In fact, um, his father-in-law wages a battle and goes and destroys the Philistines in Ezer, which is a couple miles away from Jerusalem, and gives them to Solomon and his daughter for a wedding present. So, yeah, it's kind of nice to have a pharaoh give you a city for a, a wedding present. So there, there is something militarily, economically about this, but... Why else does Solomon take another wife from Egypt? He's got one already. He's already got a child. Alliance. In Egypt, so they don't war. Yep. And protection, so we're not going to fight. Good. Luke? His dad had multiple wives. Uh, how many wives did his father have? We don't know. Scripture says it's unknown number, but it is at least a dozen, if not more, many concubines. Does God want us to have multiple wives? Does God want us to have concubines for the purpose of sexual pleasure? Does God want them? No. But father like son here. Dad took multiple wives. So do I. So yeah, there, there's a military component to this, but there's also something uh, I can take it away with it too. Fathers follow their, their sons follow their children, unfortunately. And, and here's a little bit of a negative, but they're oh, sorry, something more. It, it was a custom of the time the kings did that. Yeah, kings had a harem, right? Mm -hmm. Especially the unbelieving nations had all of that. So they can get away with it, and dad can get away with it. I don't have to follow God on his word and will here. It was a custom, a horrible custom that we're going to see. You know, we've kind of talked about this other places where the, the first verse of a chapter often sets a tone. And you may not exactly know what happened to Solomon later on, we'll get to that. But this, this verse.
verse, with his first act as king, taking another woman, we're going to see what happens when you have 300 wives and 700 concubines. We're going to see the effect it has. It's almost prophetic here. God making a warning. Son, my father, can have a negative impact on us. As Alright, so he's like his dad in verse 1. He's not listening to the Lord. But he's a little bit like his dad in verse 3. In a good way. How is Solomon like David? You don't hear this about his other sons, Absalom, Abinijah, Anna. You see them going through the motions sometimes. How is Solomon like his father, Heather? He loves God. big issue, right? Yeah, so we see we see Solomon kind of divided here. He's like his father. He worships the Lord. He walks according to his statutes. Good, 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 good. And then we've got two big negatives for Solomon. Multiple women. And what's the other negative for Solomon? The other sinful choice, Kim? Um, he's offering sacrifices and burning incense. These other, high, these other yeah. places of worship. So, yeah. it's soft on certain. Seems like more cultural uh, soft spots here. I completely, that, that's where I was going. These are cultural admissions. Culture is okay to have multiple wives. Culture, everybody worships these different places. So I'll go to the high places. <laughs> It, it seems we're not exactly sure. It seems that these high places, according to some commentators, were kind of multi-use worship spots. And you could worship Baal, and you could worship Kamosh, and you could worship the God of the Father. So, yeah. It, oh, everybody else is going? I'll do it. Everybody else married women? I'll do it. Solomon doesn't show a lot of wisdom here. And we're going to see that problem moving forward. In fact, that, that kind of leads us into question three here. God tells us to flee temptation for the sake of our souls. Solomon tolerates and welcomes sexual immorality, idolatry, the love of money. I'm going to make this alliance with Egypt so I can make some more money. And his 20-year-old youthful desires. What are Solomon's consequences for his faith later on in life? Maybe you know Solomon's life. Maybe you don't. You can probably guess. Early on in 20, I tolerate sexual immorality. I tolerate greed. I tolerate worshiping God and following the culture. What's going to happen to him later on? He's going to fall away because he's going to listen to his other wives. Scripture talks about how his heart is divided, torn, pulled away. 20 years old, the son of David, the best of all of the kids, mentioned 20. He makes those concessions to sin at 20. And the damage it has at 40 and 50 and 60. Is there something there for us? Is there something there for us if we tolerate sin, if we tolerate sexual immorality, if we tolerate greed? If we tolerate the love of money, will we have similar endings like Solomon? Very possible. Very possible. Catch it. Wins. <coughs> Usually, 
got a plan. <laughs> However, if you start off bad and then turn to be good, so it does, it does work. Well. Yeah. So usually the devil wins and God rescues later. But we've read enough in this book and this story as we're in this, this Old Testament. We've seen enough people who have made those concessions and not gotten out of it. Who have died in unbelief and unrepentance. So there is something for us, Luke, to this point. But well, in the same way, if you start giving into that stuff at an early age, you get married, you have children, now your children see that. So yeah. it's a continuing cycle, generation to generation. One little change, concession, could have generations of impact. Yeah. Someone else did this. Tolerating sin early. I think all of us, <laughs> all of us know the right answer, right? I mean, we, we know that a mixed heart is not pure to the Lord, but how easy it is, like Solomon, to follow the ways of culture. How easy it is to say, well, this makes good military sense. Dad did it. I'll take another at 20. And it wasn't enough to have two. So there will be a thousand women in his harem. There is something to learn from the sins of the fathers in the Old Testament. And here we see Solomon's heart divided. May there be a lesson for us not to have a divided heart. Last comments. A book of page. We're going to see, even in spite of his divided heart, we're going to see some actual real faith from the sun. Yeah, we're going to see the other boys. Some dudes are killing them. Verse 4. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Question five, at Solomon's second coronation, David burned 3,000 animals at the altar in Jerusalem. It's a big celebration. He was afraid to go to Gibeon, about six miles away, where the bronze altar of burnt offering was held in the Mosaic Temple. After God's slaughter of 70,000 Israelites brought about by David's prideful sin. So, just to explain this, because this took me some time to think about this week. There's two places for sacrifice. There's Gibeon, where the tabernacle that they had it when they were going through the desert, and they had this big altar that was made. There all this, all this sacrifice in Gibeon. And then there was a place in Jerusalem. David had brought the Ark of the Covenant back. He had made some sort of altar there. And at Jerusalem, he had sacrificed 3,000 animals for his son's coronation, the public one, not the private one. They did when they had to kill the brother. Um, so there's some sort of altar in Jerusalem that can accommodate 3,000 animals being birds. So Pretty good size. And then also the instituted one in Gibeon. David had done his work at home in Jerusalem. Why does Solomon, his first religious act as king, why does he travel six miles northwest to Gibeon to sacrifice a thousand of his own animals on that altar? Could have stayed home. He could have said, Dad, I already did 3,000. He could have attended himself to the busy duties of the kingdom. Why did he go six miles to Gibeon to sacrifice a thousand more? Christy? Because his dad did. His dad sacrificed good. He did follow his father like son here. Keep going on this. There's something more to that. John? Well, that's the actual altar you're supposed to use. That is the one God wants it to be at, right? So, he's, to follow God's word, he has to sacrifice the animals on the area that he's, you know, the direct line to God. Right? The, I'm, the scripture said he walked according to the statutes. I'm going to God's altar over here, and I'm going to burn a thousand. Right? Whole burnt offerings. Not smoked meat. Everything's gone at the end. Right? I follow my father. I follow the Lord's command. Why? A thousand animals, a thousand animals, six miles away? Him? I really don't know, but I'm just kind of guessing it, it, that he, he may be trying to make some kind of reparations for this previous sin. And again, we, it needs blood, so we go and sacrifice animals. So I don't know if he's just trying to 
really change a perception or something, you know, like to, yeah, take care of what has been done before and now we're at a new slate. So I, I think, I think there's a lot to that. This, this new slate idea, dad did it when he was king, but I'm king now. And I want to walk according to the Lord's ways. Got a little problem with that early on. But I'm supposed to go to Gibeon. Dad was afraid to go to Gibeon because the angel of the Lord had a big sword and he was afraid to leave, right? But I'm not afraid of the Lord. So I'm going to go to Gibeon. And I'm going to sacrifice my own animals. Is this at all commanded? No. Why does he do it? Putting the best construction on Solomon's actions, walking according to the Lord, following his statutes? This is the heart of faith saying, I want to praise God for making me king. I want to take of my own gifts, my own flocks, my own birds, and say thank you to the Lord, according to his statutes. I'm conflicted, but I'm still going to give God praise. When his brothers did sacrifice, it was always to try to get the kingdom right. They're always trying to do something at this place or that place. They're always this, this squabble among them. Here Solomon does it simply because, putting the best in front of I'm going to say thank you to God for making me king. We can, we can hope at least there's some trueness to that. I'm willing to agree. There, there might be, oh, I'm kind of guilty, let's do that. But a thousand animals, especially when they added 3,000, doesn't seem to be, you know, hopefully it's, hopefully it's doing it for the right reason. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if Solomon's got some prideful selfish reasons for doing it as well, so he doesn't bring upon the wrath of God that God did to his father by right? killing 70,000. Yeah, know. right. You start to wonder. I mean, I, to, to me at least, the fact that God appears to him after the sacrifice and says, ask for anything, I'll give it to you. You know, we're going to see later, God knows the, the thoughts and motives of the heart. So that's where I, I feel pretty confident in saying this is pureness in Solomon doing it. Because if it wasn't pure, God would not reward, so to speak, with this massive gift. And we see the pureness a little later in what he asks for. So, yeah, it, unfortunately, Solomon's given us examples that we can kind of doubt his faithfulness to the Lord. Hopefully here, based on God's response, hopefully this is a man following his father's religion. He's following his father in the bedroom, so to speak. He's following his father in the military office, so to speak, making alliances. Maybe now he's following him at the temple where he should be at the tabernacle. I'm going to kill a thousand animals to say thank you to the Lord. It's not required. My coronation's already done. But this is my first act of stepping out in faith. Thank you, God. It's going to be at the right place. So, my opinion, you could, you could disagree. I'm hopeful that's, that was why he made the track and didn't fear the Lord in front of but, but I do want to highlight, if you don't know all that background, you said, okay, so we kill a thousand rams, who cares, you know? If you don't know the background in the situation, you don't see what it is for Solomon to leave, leave the city of David, make the trek, go to the Institute of Tabernacle, and make the sacrifice. This, this was that. I'm going to follow the faith of my father. And we're going to see God. God receives a warm, very warm blessing. The son actually continues in faith. You don't see that often, especially in David's life. Other thoughts, comments? No. So, I saw a hand, a clear shoulder. Go ahead. Okay, so just kind of looking back at the other verse 2, <laughs> it says that they were sacrificing at the high priest because the temple had not yet been built. So but was it kind of default? Like there wasn't necessarily a place, and people still wanted to, so they just used these two places so they would be more set up in this society, you know, just being the top two places. So now it makes a little more sense in my head to go to, the, I mean, it was, you know, where he's going to catch the most people there. It, it, it and is. offer to God like a huge offering to God, and it really shows everybody, okay, this guy's different. There is something public about it. Doing it in Gibeon outside of Jerusalem. And because the temple, all Israel's not unified in one worship yet at the temple, you make the more difficult trek to show your sincerity ideally. And the people pick up on that. Yeah. There, there is a very lengthy 
question, which I, I probably did too much research in, on high places and appropriate uh, Jewish and uh, false doctrine worship. But, but to simply, if you're wondering about high places, I can tell you, I, did, I was actually reading, uh, we mentioned him before, Professor Heinrich Ewald from the 18th century, a German professor in Göttingen. Uh, my German isn't good, I have to rely on the English translation, but, but I, I agree with Professor Ewald here, where he says in volume six, when he talks about, you know, this, this is a man doing it for the right reasons. He's still conflicted because he's going to the high places, but it's a lot in faith to go out to Gibeon when dad wouldn't leave home. Uh, so I, I agree with the rest of you all. Something else. All right, let's, let's keep going. So after we got 1,000 thousand people, 1,000 animals sacrificed. Then the Lord appears to him that night. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Kind of open ended, huh? I need like a Ferrari, God. Um, but, but David sets us up here. David wrote in Psalm 37 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Think about God's offer to Solomon. You hear the king, <coughs> you sacrifice to me, ask whatever you want me to give you. No limitations. This is the genie for a Latin without any limitations in the greatest sense. What does what this offer reveal to us? About God and Solomon and the Psalms. So let's, let's think about God's mercy. What does it reveal that God comes to a conflicted king and says, ask for whatever you want me to do? Bill? I would say uh, that God was impressed. <laughs> you know, he was like, uh, I, I won't say dumbfounded, but it's, it's like he just over, he just so happy that that, uh, the, that turned out the way it did, that he uh, was, was worshipped and so on, and it's been a long time coming, I guess. So he says, uh, uh, anything you want. Yeah, of all your siblings, all your dead ones, they didn't worship me this way. Finally, <coughs> you seem to get it. <coughs> God gives this gift, right? It does seem to please the Lord. This gift. God's, God's been waiting for this from a descendant of David for a while. Yeah. I agree, Ken. How long does it take to get to Gideon? Maybe a day, but if you gotta carry a, get a, get a thousand animals with you and you gotta bring people from here. From here to Gideon? To Gideon. Oh, to Gideon? I, I don't know how long it takes. Gibeon was uh, six miles northwest of Jerusalem. Yeah. It would be a long trip for us to get there from here. So much. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, we could probably go. We could have bust all the other days. <laughs> all right. So this, the light yourself, God's mercy, right? To to Solomon, he gives him anything. Imagine God saying anything, anything you want, I'll give to you. The most gracious, merciful gift. To a man, does Solomon deserve this? He's got two wives, he's burning at high places. Does he deserve it? This, it, in spite of Solomon's conflicted heart, God is still massively mercy. Um, we sometimes praise Solomon for asking for wisdom. That's, that's okay. He did ask for the right thing, but God's mercy is that he would offer it to, to a sinful man like Solomon so that Solomon could care for his kingdom he's established. Luke. Well, just the fact that God's willing to give him more. He's already king of Israel. Yeah. David's already made it a peaceful nation. I mean, what more do you want? Right. You're, you're, David's already got plans for the temple that you're going to build me. That's going to take seven years. You're already safe and protected. At 20. He's got a thousand head to sacrifice. How big are his herds to begin with? How much is how much is dad inherited down to him? You you're not that many. You're not that many generations away from slaves in Egypt, and your power is so great. And, and we know that the Pharaoh dynasty at this time is at the end of the Tanic dynasty, so they're going down. But but you have gone up, and they have gone down to the point where Pharaoh wants to merge with former slaves. Um, you're at the top of the world. 
And God gives him hope. So God is really merciful. That shines through. What about Solomon's heart? That God would offer this to Solomon. Yeah? His heart is with his people. Yes. We're going to see that. We, we, do, we talk about it being conflicted, but we see his heart is thinking of his people. Good. What else do we know about Solomon's heart? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What else do we know? Yeah? His heart is with the Lord. Yeah. It's he like the rest of us. He's not without fault, and he's trying. Yes, he's looking in the right direction. Yeah, we're trending in the right direction. God wants to give him his delights because his delights is in him. And the last one, what do we learn about the Psalms? We're going to see this a little bit later. And maybe in a bunch of Christians who believe the Bible to be 100% true, no additions, no subtractions, we don't have to say it, but let's actually just go ahead and say it. His dad wrote something under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it is true, right away. Right away, God's Word. Already powerful, already true, not even a generation ago. Yeah, we go, I mean, we have a lot of other passages we use for that comfort that God's word is true. But here, here in a generation, we start to see those distinctions. So, so we learn we learn about God's mercy, we learn about Solomon's heart, and we also learn a little bit about the Psalms. But what is what was David's heart for his son? What did he want his son to be? Question seven is what he says at Solomon's coronation. This is in First Chronicles 28. I just have a couple of verses there. This is verses verse nine and ten. Verse nine, excuse me. What is David's heartfelt desire for his son? And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart understands every motive behind the thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. What's David's heart for his son Solomon? At his coronation, when everyone's watching, what does he want for his boy? We, help! Prosperity, happiness, faith. And what kind of a faith? Very strong faith. Believe whatever. You got to follow God's laws and you will prosper. Okay. Just go through the motions? Follow them occasionally when it benefits you? What are the word choices here? Wholehearted. He wishes something for his son he himself doesn't have. Wholehearted devotion to the Lord. And a willing mind. The most important thing for a child to grow up in faith, as Mike said earlier. Now at the end of a man's life, all this money, all this animals, all this stuff, I don't, I don't even mention that. I'll kill 3,000 of them just to say praise the Lord. But you, the most important thing about you is that your heart and mind are wholeheartedly to the Lord. Everything else I don't care. Do we ever talk like that to our children? <coughs> Do we ever talk like that to our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our neighbors? It's important they do well in school, extracurriculars. It's great when they have friends and do things. And well, it's not as good. But for as much as we've seen David to be a pretty awful man in the last couple of weeks, he ends on a bang. Do we talk like David does to our children and grandchildren? Love the Lord wholeheartedly and everything else who cares. There is some encouragement here to learn from his example. This could be something we could use. We don't have to burn 3,000 animals, thankfully, to do it as well. No one's becoming king. But the idea of saying, let's talk to our kids more about the Lord and less about this and that. What a great example. What a great encouragement. What's something for us to listen to maybe if we are 20 years old or a teenager or looking for 
forward to the rest of our life from beginning, that middle, or end. To say this, this, this.
You know, we know, we know David rules for 40 years, 33 and 7 split. And we know David is anointed early, and it, it, it does seem he's dying around, you know, if you, if you think about him as a young boy, then going to battle, his brothers are in battle, he's not. You start to say, okay, maybe David dies around 65, you know, it, kind of a guess. We know Solomon's 20, so we know he's seen the back half of life, how much he's seen. He maybe hasn't seen all of it. We know that Adonijah was the oldest because of him being born in Hebrew, where David was first. So, it seems like a good guess to see he's seen a lot of calamity. He hasn't seen all of it, but he certainly lives in the household where a lot of the self-inflicted calamity is still there. Where you know Tamar is living by Absalom by herself. You know, so I he, he maybe hasn't seen all of it, but I, you gotta say he's old enough to have seen most of it in our timeline. And clearly enough to open his eyes. Yeah, I, I, I can't answer for certain though. I'm guessing a little bit, but. He's old enough at 20 if you remember. Why else does he ask, Byron? Well, even though he was young, I feel like he was humble. I had, had some wisdom for his age because when he asked the Lord, well, who is able to govern this great people of yours? Even he doesn't think he's capable. So when it shows being humble but also wisdom to him, we kind of get an idea of why God picked something. Yeah, right. And you really do. You really see how God has chosen. You know, David, David made that. Your Solomon is going to sit on my throne. And David had to fight him on the other ones. But you also see that selection. Yeah. John? He's going to also distinguish between right and wrong. Not just. Yeah. Yes. It's a word choice. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the word choice. The discerning part of this distinguish between right and wrong, which comes up with the right part of it. I want to be wise so I can serve others. Right? Man, I wish God gave me wisdom. I could invest in the stock market and make a lot of money. I could bet and win all my bets. The wisdom that he wants is entirely in me. He's already got enough money. He's already got a kingdom. He's already got everything he needs. He's got a wife and child, another wife, unfortunately, at 20. And yet he says, I need wisdom. I made a military decision, maybe, to ally with Egypt. Um, but it's not about military decisions now. It's about leading God's people in the way that they are supposed to be led. And I need your help to serve the Lord, because I am too young to do this right. A lot of songs. Yes, please. I think what you're saying is, I'm willing to go through the trials and tribulations and the experiences your will instead of my will. I thought it was what C.S. Lewis said. Experience is a good teacher. Yeah. And that's how, that's how we learn. Yeah. We go through the, the steps and the, the, the process. And hopefully his experience from what he's done with his family already is starting to... But you have to experience. Fortunately, we... You know, you talk to somebody it. about swimming all day long with her. Then the food went.
And it, it, you really see the humble, I appreciate what Myron's point, the humble faith to say, I need help from you, Lord. Whether we're a 20-year-old king or 20-year-old college student or a 70-year-old grandparent, it doesn't matter, right? Lord, give me your wisdom so that I can serve the people you put with me. Maybe not a kingdom, maybe just a wife or a child or a friend or my coworker, or whatever it is, right? Lord, I need your wisdom because my own heart is not reliable. My own heart tends towards sin. No, no surprise then for teenagers in Jerusalem and Jesus in, in the Jewish time. What was their required reading? The wisdom of Solomon. As you are preparing for a service in the government, what was their required reading? The wisdom of Solomon. Even Daniel, when he's in exile, what's he reading? So you see that I need the wisdom from you to serve. And for all of the things we can pick on Solomon, you really see his heart. It, there's, there's a lot of purity here. Help me be your servant, your people. And uh, as we're going to say a little bit later, I think that's a prayer all of us can say. Because <laughs> all of us need that. That was the servant. We the proverb that was an option to all of the songs. In other words, Solomon moved through the process of understanding what the songs I, some, some have said that. I, I think when I read Proverbs, I see a man who has been blessed with incredible wisdom from God, almost like Jesus does, trying to make massively big things simple in a proverb or a parable. So to, to me, I, I know phonetically sometimes with the poetry, it's similar to the Psalms. To me, I think it's God's way of blessing us with a massive amount of wisdom that he gave to his servant Solomon that is recorded in some of these proverbs for us. This is God's way of making big truths simple for a dummy like me. Whether it's literally, linguistically, phonetically, an offshoot of the Psalms, that's for some of the Hebrew scholars, I think it's just for the simple Christian. Here, there's a, you, you read one book, one chapter of the Proverbs, and it, there's a lot in there, like six verses are massive. You read one of the Psalms, you know, we sing the Psalms every Sunday. You read, there, there's a lot in there. I mean, sometimes you can't get through three verses without saying, well, that's enough. There's a half hour. You know, so I, I do think it's God's way of making it simple for, for us. Um, linguistically, I guess I'm not as concerned about the offshoot. Practically, though, it is something to read the Psalms and the Proverbs together. This, this wisdom, this prayer book of the people. There is something to say, Lord, give me some wisdom. I want to read the New Testament, too, but... There's something about seeing David's difficulties and then seeing Solomon's wisdom that David should have had. Did I answer your question? Well, why does the proverb get more into don't be free to do There is some of that, yeah. Otherwise, here's the result. And they describe, and Proverbs describe someone who doesn't do these things.
sitting here and you're abusing me and I have no idea what I'm doing. It has nothing to do with me. So, and again, it just goes back to that heart and the desires of the heart where your heart is set and your intentions going forward. So. I'll say, keep following. I also think about that time in the early 1500s with the Pope and the bishops and princesses. Uh, people looked up to them and prayed to them because they were the ultimate. They were higher than yeah. anybody else. Yeah. Well, I mean, they didn't need to fall on their knees. Yeah. Martin Luther is saying, yes, you do, but you always need God's guidance. Yeah. No, no matter where you are in life, yeah. on those knees, that's right. right. And you're facing an spiritual. spirituality. Someone else, this is a good so far. Very good. Yeah. Well, if you just read the first section, you know, he's very, you know, taking it upon himself that he was the greatest. And it doesn't actually say that, you know, but he's taking it the other way. I mean, if you just take that first section right. out of context, right, he's putting himself on top. Yeah. He doesn't do that, does he? That's like reading the Bible. If you want to read a section, you're in trouble. <laughs> you, you, you can be, yeah. You can get a whole different intent. That's not what God is. There's a full message here. Does, does, does Luther give himself glory? No. He calls it incurable rashness. That, that, that self-pride. I can do it. I don't need help. I'll do it my way. Whatever your office is, asking the Lord for help. Whatever your job is. It could be the most important job in the world or something that society says, oh, that's not even important. It doesn't really matter. There is blessing. Whatever my job is, however I serve him, there is blessing in saying, Lord, give me guidance, counsel, wisdom, and strength to attend the office to provide for me. Allow me to serve you in this way. Sir. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son, and he was dead. 
I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw he wasn't the son I had born. The other woman said, no, the living son, one is my son, the dead son is yours. But one insisted, no, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. So they argued before the king. The king said, this one says, my son is alive, your son is dead. The other says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. Brought a sword for the king, he gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive and was filled with compassion for her son and said to the king, please, my lord, give her the living baby or kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him, cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling, give the living baby to the first woman, do not kill him, she is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. The household he grew up in, the infighting and the difficulty, and yet what is the determining factor between the two women? How will he find the true mother? He will search for the one who has Solomon asked for wisdom, and God gave him a discerning heart to seek compassion for the need. You and I have our difficult situations, our own struggles, our own families, our own co-workers, places, etc. There's something about praying like Solomon, like Martin, like any Christian. Give me wisdom, Lord, and a discerning heart to deal with your people. Next week, we'll look at Solomon building the temple. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask for your compassion, for your wisdom. Grant us every day the grace and the knowledge and the understanding and the confidence to hold to your word and to love the people you've entrusted to us and to provide for them according to their needs and to do it with the wisdom and compassion of Solomon. In your son's name we pray. Thank you.